Hello everybody, my name's James. And I'm Liam. And together we are the History Boys. Sixty percent of the population wiped out. Fifty million dead in just a few years. One of the greatest catastrophes in human history. It was known to contemporaries as the pestilence or simply the mortality. To us today, we know it as the Black Death. This is the Great Plague of 1348. I'm here in Norwich to discuss the plague and the reason I'm in Norwich is because it's the capital of East Anglia. Now East Anglia is a very historic region just east of England and it was ravaged particularly hard by the plague. Indeed it says that 60% of the population in East Anglia died of the plague which compares to 50% as a European average and 40% as an English average. The population of Norwich itself it's claimed to be 20,000 prior to the plague arriving and after just a few months, 6,000. Needless to say, this area was hit particularly hard. Now this wasn't the first time that Europe had been decimated by the pestilence. The plague of Justinian in 541 had ravaged Europe and the decaying empire. But what made the Great Plague of 1348 so historically significant? To find out, we have to look at where it came from. Although the precise origins of the plague are still a matter for dispute, it is nevertheless generally accepted that this particular pestilence is likely to have originated amongst the rodents of the Central Asiatic Plains, around what we would know as modern day Mongolia. Now, how long the plague festered there amongst those vast steppes is still largely unknown. However, what we do know is that the plague began to move westwards, and around 1346 we have our first scattered reports. Our first really definitive accounts of the plague don't appear until the spring of 1347, when it reaches Constantinople, the historic capital of the Byzantine Empire. At the time there was a belief that up to 90% of the city had perished, figures which we can say with a little historical hindsight are suspect to say the least. That being said, the tendency to over-exaggerate the numbers of dead, which is a consistent theme throughout many of our surviving sources, really speaks to the psychological impact of the plague. What we can say is that for the residents of Constantinople, this would have been like nothing they had ever seen before. The words of Demetrius Caedonis, chronicle at the court in Constantinople, really speak to the sense of impending doom that would have gripped the city. Every day we bring out our friends for burial. And every day the city becomes emptier, and the number of graves increases. By the summer of 1347, the plague was rapidly spreading southwards, across modern day Turkey into Syria, and west into Greece and Macedonia. However, this is not the travel itinerary of the plague as it was to arrive in Western Europe. Instead, we must look to a small colony from the city state of Genoa snuggled on the north coast of the Black Sea, called Kaffa, on the site of modern-day Theodosia. The story goes that the plague entered the city of Kaffa, courtesy of an invading army of Tatars, a semi-nomadic tribe who had allied with Genghis Khan in his great conquest and subsequent establishment of the Mongol Empire in the early 13th century. It is said that whilst laying siege to the city, the Tatars flung corpses of their infected dead over the city ramparts. Now, some modern historians have put a question mark over the accuracy of this tale. It is, after all, a rather convenient narrative device for a pious people, such as the Genoese were, looking to make sense of such calamity. Why face the painful conclusion that God could have abandoned his faithful flock? Better that the cause for such despair should originate with a heathen people. Alas, it's likely we will never know for sure the truth of the matter. However, what we do know, is that by the autumn of 1347, a small fleet of Genoese ships, full of infected sailors, had set sail and were soon to arrive in the Sicilian port city of Messina. Almost immediately, 
people began to fall ill. Friar de Michele de Piazza, a primary source for the arrival of the plague in Messina, suggests that, as the gangplanks fell and the Genoese sailors rolled onto the docks, that anyone who so much as spoke with one of them became infected and could not avoid death. As word from Sicily spread, authorities began to make preparations for the arrival of the plague. Ports were closed to infected ships, often using burning arrows. This, alas, was to prove futile. The plague arrived in Genoa in December 1347, in Venice by the following January, and by the spring of 1348 it had moved southwards into much of mainland Italy. Death tolls were great. In Florence, where the best surviving documents exist, it is estimated that up to 50% of the population, from a total of 100,000, had perished. Most of the western continent was soon to suffer a similar fate. The plague landed at Marseille and had reached the papal city of Avignon. In just a few months, a contemporary source suggests that up to 62,000 had perished in the city. By the summer of 1348, Paris, home to the greatest university of the medieval world, was struck by the plague. What's astounding is that in the space of less than a year, the plague had gone from Sicily to having domain over the lion's share of Western Europe. The sheer efficiency of the plague is staggering. Although overall death rates are estimated to be around 30 to 40 percent, they are often much higher in the urban centres than medieval city. If we want to understand why the plague was so virulent, we must understand what conditions were like in the medieval city. What made them such fertile hunting grounds for this most voracious of predators? Life in the medieval city was far from ideal. It was actually perfect for the spread of the plague. Hygiene in medieval England was nothing like it is today. Firstly, a street like this one would have had excrement flowing down the middle of it. Animals in the street were commonplace. People would say they couldn't move for horse dung. Pigs and rats were as common as cats and dogs are today. Indeed, Edward III even caused outcry by admitting that he had had three baths in three months. This is a society who were not used to hygiene, who did not really understand the science behind hygiene. They would live in incredibly dense situations, often nine people to a single room. It was the perfect breeding ground for the pestilence. The Europe of 1300 was already starting to look quite different from the one of even 100 years before. From 1200, the population had risen by 10 million, which is almost double the increase from the century before. This was a continent very much in the early stages of transition, away from the social and economic stagnation that had typified the Dark Ages. Many of the developments which we find in this transitionary period help us to explain, at least in part, the remarkable passage of the plague by the time it hits England in 1348. Firstly, the medieval economy was beginning to acquire an increasingly global character. There were dozens of new trading networks by 1280, many of which had expanded further eastwards than ever before. This of course was accompanied by an aggressive form of colonial expansion, as is illustrated in the story of Caffa. This helped to facilitate the easy flow of people and goods from east to west, and is very much a key conduit for the plague's rapid transmission. A strand of the plague which, in other circumstances, may have remained undisturbed in its slumber for centuries, now found no shortage of less than willing hosts for its great migration. Secondly, people within Europe had become increasingly mobile. The expansion in trade routes had facilitated greater travel, and military campaigns had become much larger in scale. The consequent mass of human bodies trampling across Europe in states of great distress and squalor may have also been a contributing factor to the plague spread. Finally, we must look at the consequences of what a larger, more mobile population would mean for a society without the appropriate infrastructure to accommodate it. 
Not long after the turn of the century, a decrease in global temperatures led to a series of environmental catastrophes, particularly large floods, which caused major disruption to harvests. This resulted in what we call the Great Famine of 1315 to 1317. Floods devastated many grains and bean crops, turning fields barren. This led to malnutrition and in some cases starvation across the board, lowering immune systems and making populations vulnerable to conditions such as typhoid fever and a strand of pestilence we would now know as anthrax. It is estimated that 10 to 15% of Europe's population were killed as a result of the famine. A recent set of research conducted at Harvard analysed the data collected using modern scientific techniques alongside tradition written historical records. They concluded that the wet weather which led to the famine may have affected a much longer period than traditionally thought. This would suggest a deep prolonged food shortage in the years leading up to the Black Death. Rather than a flash in the pan type affair, the plague is better understood in this context as the apex of a fermenting crisis of a society in flux, fueled by overpopulation, climate change, malnutrition and war. And this is where we find England in the summer months of 1348. By this point, word of the plague would have long since reached English shores, and we know that directives were already being distributed from the clergy urging confession and ordering penitent processions and masses. The mood is summed up well in the words of the Bishop of Bath and Wells. The catastrophic pestilence from the east has arrived in a neighbouring kingdom, and it is very much to be feared. <sighs> that unless we pray devoutly and incessantly, a similar pestilence will stretch its poisonous branches into this realm. When did the plague actually hit? Although precise dates vary, there is still a broad consensus that the plague first appeared on English shores in Weymouth, a port in Dorset on the south coast, sometime from late June to early August 1348. Before long, it had taken Bristol, a prominent city in the west, and was now hungrily looking east. The plague had arrived in England. People in 1348 were used to the idea of death, but they were not used to this orderless death, this death without God and without family. And the presiding fear in cities like Norwich at the time was is this God's punishment? Why is God punishing us? Perhaps even worse, is God abandoning his children? It has been suggested that the plague arrived in Norwich via inland routes from London. However, looking at records from parishes just south of Norwich, we can see that the plague didn't actually arrive in those areas until the spring of 1349. What seems more likely is that Norwich's biggest vulnerability was actually its greatest asset as well, its trade river, the most important trade route it had into the city. Now the citizens of Norwich considered themselves protected. Let's not forget that Norwich was one of the biggest cities in England at the time, the second city in fact. So we had a huge wall surrounding the city and where there wasn't wall there was river. It felt as though the city was impermeable, as though nothing could get into the city. But that all changed when word came from London. The city went from feeling invincible to feeling like if London, the most powerful, biggest city in England, was vulnerable, surely every city was vulnerable. And the question became not will we get the plague, but when will we get the plague? At the start of 1349, that question was answered. Death had finally arrived in Norwich. Next time on The Black Death, we'll be heading out into the English countryside to uncover the reality of life in the 1300s and to explore the earth-shattering impact on the medieval spirit when the plague reaches God's own country. There'll be a fresh episode of The History Boys each and every month uncovering key turning points in history. So if you like this video, please make sure to like, share and subscribe.